As I said at the service's beginning, today marks our first Sunday of the liturgical season of Lent. It is a season in which we head to the wilderness, recalling that God's people have been led to the wilderness since the dawn of time. Even as we recall the stories of the Israelites, of Hagar, and even of Jesus that we will hear this morning, we are reminded that no one goes to the wilderness alone. The Holy Spirit is always there. God is true to God's promises to be with God's people. And so in hope, we sing of God's rest being available to us even as we enter the season of Lent and even as we acknowledge that we live in a world in which there is much chaos and suffering and war and pain. As I read these words of scripture, and I will tell you what I shared with the congregation at Journey, this is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. So read the whole thing many times. And I don't know if you should count yourselves blessed or not that I can't preach on this passage every week for the next 10 weeks, because I would if I could. But know that God's word is for us. God's Spirit is with us. And so let us hear now the words of our gospel from the fourth chapter of Luke, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, filled full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to Jesus, To you I will give their glory and all authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only God. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, If it, he, God will command God's angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So when the devil finished every test, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are here today because we have hope in your promises. Whether we feel scorched by the heat of the day or our feet are stuck in quicksand, we show up because we know our strength and our hope comes from you. You promise to be with us always, and you promise this over and over again. So draw near to us now and open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to your word, to your spirit's call, to your truth for us. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts will be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock 
and our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, when was the last time that you said no? No justification, no explanation. When did your voice just make that sound as it came through the lips and you spoke the word no? Did you utter it with a sense of urgency as if you were trying to keep a toddler's tiny fingers away from a hot stove? Did you speak the word slowly in a whispered voice? In the cushion of apologies so that your no might somehow be delivered while another's feelings might be preserved. Just saying no isn't always as simple as it might seem. Not, only for the, not even for those of us who came of age in the 80s with a campaign that told us over and over again to just say no. And that this one word could help us withstand the temptations of our adolescence. No has consequences. No can be loaded. No can be outright hard. In our text for today, we learn that immediately following his baptism, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Now, in a surprising twist, we learn that the purpose for this journey was exactly that Jesus might endure temptation from the devil for 40 days. With his identity affirmed in his baptism and confirmed through the genealogy that follows in Luke's gospel, the Holy Spirit directs Jesus to step out of the Jordan and dry off in the desert. It's time for Jesus to get ready. Public ministry is about to begin for this carpenter. The fullness of his identity is about to be revealed. One lesson, one miracle, one merciful act of forgiveness, one just moment at a time. Yet, the coach appointed by God to meet Jesus in this time of preparation is the devil. And Jesus, equipped by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, must use only these two tools to withstand the temptations that the devil throws his way. It is an odd nuance that this text presents to us for those have been taught of us who have been taught that temptations are to be avoided. If you cannot stick to just eating two cookies at a time, throw the bag away. If you are compelled to plunge into debt, take your credit card, your one emergency credit card, put it in a bowl of water and stick it in the back of your freezer so that you actually have to thaw it out before you can place any charge on your credit card. Don't look, don't touch, don't ask the hard questions because they might make life too complicated. Just say no. But Jesus faces temptation not simply as a consequence of living as a, in a human body in a world full of sin. Rather, his engagement with temptation is a divine appointment established as part of his preparation for ministry. It's part of Jesus' learning process part of his readiness for the road ahead. Even Jesus, the Son of God, needs to learn when to say yes and when to say no. Even Jesus needs to be grounded in his triune identity, strengthened by God's word as he faces what lies ahead. And even Jesus needs to be oriented toward God, whose power and purpose and way of doing things are sending him into a world to heal what's broken. All right, so spoiler alert. Just as one would expect, Jesus says no. He says no to all that Satan tries to offer him in this final exam. He says no to food for his hunger. He says no to kingdoms for his rule. And he says no to calling on armies of angels to avoid his own suffering. 
And yes, we are reminded of God's solidarity with us in Christ, that even our Savior experienced human temptation and all the discomfort that comes with it. And yes, we see that Jesus leans on the same spirit and God's word and invites us to do the same, knowing that we're going to face trials and temptations and struggles in our day too. But we also see that the need for readiness is rooted in a reality that one commentator states so eloquently. So this whole quote is not mine, it's theirs. They say, a real temptation beckons us to do that about which much good can be said. Stones to bread? The hungry hope so. Take political control? The oppressed hope so. Leap from the temple? Those longing for proof of God's power among us hope so. All this is to say that real temptation is an offer not to fall, but to rise. It is hard to know when to say no. It's hard to know how to say no. See, we live in a world where access and acceptance are not equally distributed to all. And if yeses and noes were currency, everyone would not have the same amount in of either in their bank account. And the currencies of yes and no is a two-way street. Some people have heard more yes and others have heard more no. Whether being picked for the kickball team on the playground or a leadership position in the workplace. Now for example, as a girl, I was taught to be nuanced with my nose. Bullies and catcalls should be addressed by simply ignoring them. Unwanted advances could be verbally declined, but if my makeup and clothing delivered a different message, then all bets were off. I was taught how to say no in the gentlest way possible, so that I wouldn't burn any bridges, come off as too much or too strong, because a woman who expressed authority might be seen as aggressive. I'm guessing I'm not the only one here who's heard that. I was taught how to say no with the roar of a bear in the event of needing to ward off someone whose physical presence was stronger than my own, when my voice might be my strongest tool. Yet even as I was taught these messages, I also heard many no's, even as a young girl. Could I be an acolyte or an altar server? No. Would my male coworker who flipped burgers alongside me in my teens be reprimanded when he didn't honor my leadership as assistant manager? No. In fact, he was given the title of assistant to the assistant manager, and I was told quietly to just go along with it, that sometimes it was hard for a man to listen to a woman. So when I didn't hear no to my face, I was taught to anticipate it. Could I expect to be paid the same amount of money as a male counterpart? Part? No. Could I expect senior positions, leadership roles, or to be heard without male allies surrounding me? Maybe, but probably not. I was even told when I entered seminary to expect that some classmates and even some professors would teach and understand that women should not be ordained. The delicate balance of yes and no was just what it was. It was like the air quality index for the day, and I just needed to kind of know what it was so I knew how to plan my day, when to be indoors, when to be out. And this was the air quality index for me as someone who identifies as white, 
cisgendered, straight, middle class, educated, Christian, English speaking, and right handed. But Jesus reminds us in this text that when God points us, that what God points us to in Christ over and over and over again is that our ways are not God's ways. Yet, yes, the world is God's, and all that is in it is God's, but we have created systems and structures and named them reality. We have built these systems on bias and prejudice and privilege and sometimes even hate. Look at what's going on in the world. And we have given these systems names like capitalism and democracy and a justice system and even church. And we lift them up and we set our watches by them and we look to them to help set the parameters of the life we live together. To parse out choices of righteousness and unrighteousness to tell us what to value and how much. But they're human systems. And even with the good that might be there, there's also sin. They're broken. They're flawed. They are in need of re-examination and redefinition and reconfiguration and re-imagination. Because, see, they sanction hierarchies and abuses, things like racism and sexism, heterosexism, and more. They distort our God-given identities and the God-given identities of others. They distort our values, placing priority of, of, on individual gain over collective well-being. They harm and sanction harm while being elevated as what's best. Think lots of laws coming out in Texas in the last two weeks. But Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of God's word, could tell the difference. He could step into a hurting world and heal wounds and both name and forgive sins. Because you don't have to just do one, you can also do the other. He could disrupt the systems that labeled some as righteous and others as unrighteous and told the world to hold up try again. Guess what? Things can be different because the world is God's. This Lent, we are invited to step into the wilderness with Jesus. We assume practices of fasting and praying, but perhaps we should really join Jesus in trying to figure out when to say yes and when to say no. Maybe we need to step away from the grind and immerse ourselves in God's word. Maybe we need to quit picking ourselves up from our bootstraps and practice leaning on God's Holy Spirit. In 2016, uh, an activist and a theologian named Trisha Hershey started the NAP ministry. On a blog post from August 3rd, 2031, she writes, how will you be useless to capitalism today? Please rest. Disrupt and push back against a system that views you as a machine. You are not a machine. You are a divine human being. We will rest. She writes, as recently as last week, this quote, my rest as a black woman in America suffering from generational exhaustion and racial trauma was a political refusal and social justice uprising within my body. I took to rest and naps and slowing down as a way to save my life. Resist the systems telling me to do more and more importantly, as a remembrance to my ancestors who had their dream space stolen from them. This is about more than naps. It is not about fluffy pillows, expensive sheets, silk sleep masks, or any other external frivolous consumerist gimmick. It's about a deep unraveling from white supremacy and capitalism 
These two systems hold violence and evil. History tells us this, and our present living shows this. Rest pushes back and disrupts a system that views human bodies as a tool for production and labor. It's a counter-narrative. We know that we are not machines. We are divine. So our collective theme this Lenten season as a family of faith is rest stops. We are all so well aware that the past week alone has been rough, not to mention the state of our lives in the past two years. I was watching the news this morning, and doing the morning news, the newscasters invited those watching to learn a few practices to hold back anxiety, naming that humanity is struggling in this moment with wars, with injustice, with con a continued death toll from a pandemic that still hasn't ended. And I noticed that when, when the news tells you you need to stop and breathe, like the news literally said, stop and breathe, we really need to regroup. And so I imagine that Lent just might be the blessing that we need. We don't need to pretend we're not in the wilderness. And just as Jesus paused his day-to-day -day living to focus and regroup and restore before beginning his public ministry, we have an opportunity in this 40 days to do the same. As a, exemplified by Jesus, we might entertain a practice, a practice led by the Holy Spirit, a practice informed and grounded in God's word that invites us to discern how and when we might say no and how and, might we, and when we might say yes. How might our no's disrupt systems that harm? How might our no's break bonds that oppress ourselves or others? How might our no shift the status quo, make more space for gracious, merciful love? How might our no open the door to the yes of what is possible through God? So here is what I'm trying this Lent, and I name this because I really am going to need your help in order to do this. I am not giving up chocolate or coffee. I have, think I have consumed more chocolate and coffee in the last month than I have in the last two years. So I'm just going to be honest. I'm not letting go of those. But I am trying to answer God's calls in these ways. I am going to say no to answering work emails or non-emergent texts on my days off. I am going to say no to being immediately available to others when I am playing with my child. How many of you have dinner with someone you haven't seen forever and your text alerts start going off? And I'm not going to do that, as long as you remind me. I am going to say no to internalizing conflict out of a desire to spare the feelings of another. I am going to give up over-functioning to fill in the gaps where others refuse to labor. And I am going to say yes to learning how I rely on the exploitation of others to meet my needs so that I can say yes to some actions that will enact justice. Siblings, to what will you say no this Lent? To what will you set aside so that you have more room to say yes to God, to God's will, to God's mercy, 
to God's vision for humanity, to God's call on your life, to God's actual presence with you, to God's love. To what will you say no this Lent, knowing that you, that we do not ste step into the seasons of trial or moments of temptation without the strength of God's Spirit lifting us up? Friends, might we find ways to rest, to create and support rest stops for one another so that even in the wilderness of our day, we might be fed by the bread of life, encouraged and rooted in God's word, and held in the promise that God is with us always, that in life and in death, we belong to God. Let's do this together. Let's encourage each other. Let's accompany one another on this wilderness sojourn so that through us, through Christ's body, there might be more love in this aching world. Friends, by God's grace, may it be so. Amen.